one. Welcome everyone to a special presentation of story trading. We got Jonah Lupton of Social Capital uh, over here today. Uh, before we get started, just a quick disclaimer, story trading is not an investment advisor and our guests are not either unless they specifically call out that they are. Investing in securities involves significant risk of loss and, and this meeting is being recorded, will be posted on YouTube. Just a quick overview of what story trading is for people who are not familiar. We're an investor community and we aim to beat Wall Street insiders at their own game through crowdsourced collaboration on the four pillars of fundamentals, sentiment, catalyst, and technicals. I'll ask Jonah a little bit about that later. Uh, all on aim to understand the story behind the trade. Uh, we also do Zoom events twice a week for our VIP members. This event's free, most of our events are not. Um, people present stock picks or VIP picks for being on CEOs and other uh, people to present stock ideas. Um, real quick, before we get started on, uh, Jonah is going to present a stock today, so I, I can't wait about that. But uh, we're going to track his performance on the stock he presents. So if you, at your own leisure, when you head over to storytrading.com, you can click on performance and you can see these are all our guest presenters and presenters from our VIP program and we track their performance and you can see how it does compare to NASDAQ and Kathy's RQ. RK. Um, we got all kinds of great stats here, return by presenter over here. So you can take a look at that on your own time there. Okay, and with that, uh, Jonah, we're gonna turn it over to you. Uh, before we get started on talking about stocks, I'd like to spend a few minutes, uh, if you can just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background uh, then I may have a couple questions for you about your process and what you're doing for social capital, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. So I got out of college in 2002, started working for Morgan Stanley, spent 10 years in the investment industry. Uh, I guess they call it the wealth management industry where I was running um, client portfolios for high net worth individuals and some institutional accounts like foundations, um, endowments and whatnot. And then after about 10 years of doing that, I just, I kind of got the itch to do something different. You know, I wanted to jump into the tech startup world. Uh, so then I did startups for the next three or four years. And then I got into the paint industry with SoundGuard and I won't go into detail, but uh, the pandemic kind of wiped out SoundGuard's uh, business prospects. So that's when I kind of pivoted back into the investment industry you know, back when the pandemic started, I mean, there wasn't really much for me to do with regards to my company. So I got onto Twitter and started spending a lot of time talking to other investors about stocks and, you know, kind of re re-engaging the markets and uh, rebuilding my portfolio. Since most of my capital had been, had been invested in my company, um, I had to rebuild my investment portfolio and, and try to figure out a strategy. Um, so I did that through 2020. And then, you know, over the last three or four months, I've kind of pivoted into the small cap, mid cap space. And, you know, I, I take pride in my transparency. So for the last three or four months, I've been posting uh, my portfolio on my Twitter account. You know, it's currently uh, not being updated because I'm building out my fund for social capital. And I wanted a week or two to build out the fund, you know, without having to disclose any positions. And then once I have the fund built out, you know, then I can kind of get back to uh, posting on that Google sheet. But, you know, I think there's a lot of other investors out there that are trying to discover these small high growth companies. And that's obviously what I'm focused on. And I think people appreciate the transparency. Uh, that's kind of what got me interested in what social capital is doing. So Chamath, who runs social capital, uh, you know, came out with this idea back in November, I think, where he would you know, uh, set up an application process and pick 10 managers from, you know, different backgrounds, different styles to basically run some of his money. And I don't know exactly how long that's going to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are still up in the air as to, you know, uh, when, you know, when will more capital come in or when will this be open to the public or retail investors or LPs? So I don't know. I don't have those answers right now. I mean, we're just kind of playing it by year, which is fine with me. But, you know, this gives me a, you know, an opportunity to run, you know, more of an institutional style fund. Um, but it's a lot of the same stocks that I'm doing right now in my personal portfolio. So, you know, small mid caps, under 5 billion in market cap, 
growing at at least 30%, but in most cases, 40, 50, 60, 70%, you know, and that's not just this year, that should be for the next two, three, four years. And these are going to be, you know, these are highly disruptive companies that are either, you know, taking on a larger competitor with something that's better, or they're literally just creating a new category for themselves, where they can dominate that category for the next five, 10, 15 years. So, uh, I'm excited, you know, not only do I kind of love what I'm doing right now in the small cap space, I'm publishing a newsletter, I run a stock twits room, but then getting getting a chance to run this capital for, uh, or get, running, getting ready to run this fund for social capital, uh, which I've been building out for the last three days now is, uh, is a great opportunity. Great, Jonah, you answered almost all my questions. I was very efficient uh, and succinct there. But so let me ask you this. Uh, you know, I came across you uh, a few months ago because uh, we had a common interest in Dario. I found you on Twitter, oh, yeah. uh, Dario Health. I, I got into that very early and a lot of our people in our community did. Um, and But I've noticed over the last couple of months that you have a pretty rabid following and it, kind of people see you, I think, is kind of a, a Kathy Woods kind of figure. Uh, I've seen people asking you to build your own ETF. Um, so I'm wondering if you can pinpoint one point in, in your, you know, uh, experience in the past year, when, when was it that I'll, that'll change for you? What, what was the inflection point that you became this, uh, very popular figure that people uh, look up to? When did that happen? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I'm nowhere near Kathy Wood. I mean, she's on a, a level all by herself right now. I mean, what she's done the last three, four, five years is, is pretty incredible. I mean, obviously she's only gotten a lot of that attention in the last year, you know, as, as the AUM at their firm has gone from, I think, 6 billion to 60 billion, you know, great calls on Tesla, Square, Roku. I mean, we've really moved into this, you know, disruptive um, uh, tech economy. So she was at the, the, the forefront of that. But I, I mean, I think, you know, I think people appreciate ARC for their transparency. You know, they put out an email at the end of every day with their buys and sells. So they are, you know, holding themselves accountable to their investors. Um, they also put out a lot of research that, you know, white papers, they host webinars. Um, so I think, I just think investors appreciate that style versus the kind of the old school style of hedge funds where they try to keep everything kind of secretive, black box, you know, behind the scenes, you know, we've, this is our information, our research. We're not going to give everyone, you know, we're not going to give it to anybody else. We want to keep this for ourselves, you know, so that we have an edge over the competition. And I think we've sort of, I think that's starting to change where not, not that data is a weapon, but, you know, if I've, if I've done my research on a company and I have a lot of conviction on that stock, you know, there's pros and cons to sharing that information with others. You know, I could keep it to myself and I could continue to build a position and hope that at some point the market, you know, realizes what I already think and then comes pouring into the stock, thus pushing it higher after I've had a chance to already build a bigger position, or I can share that research once I have it and let other people, you know, the people that follow me on Twitter or Substack in this case, get into that stock as early as possible before the big investors get in. So, I mean, there's pros and cons to both, um, but I've obviously taken the, you know, the, the former. So, you know, once I find a company that I really love and I spend 10, 12, 15 hours doing, you know, research and due diligence on it, talking to some other investors, if it's a med, you know, med device company or like a really technical company, um, you know, sort of like Transmedics, which I wrote about recently, you know, I'll talk to some cardiologists that might know that space better than me. Uh, in the case of Transmedics, it was actually a cardiologist that brought that stock to my attention. So, you know, as I've sort of grown my, you know, exposure, I guess, on Twitter, a lot of people are now DMing me their favorite stocks or sending me emails or posting it in my stock twits room. So I'm finding out about these companies quicker. Now, of course, you know, when you get 100 messages a day, you have to try to, you know, filter out the ones that might actually be worth something. So, you know, that I probably spend a couple hours a day just doing like quick DD on, you know, uh, like a new idea or stock I've never heard of, you know, trying to get to that point where I'm like, you know, as quickly as possible, where I'm saying, no, this is not a stock that I would invest in so that I don't waste any more time on it. But I, I just think generally speaking, Twitter is becoming a place where retail investors spend a lot of their time talking to other retail investors, trying to get an edge, like what you guys do, you know, trying to get an edge on Wall Street, you know, and, and get into some of these, you know, these di dynamic companies before the big funds do. Yeah. 
Perfect. Absolutely. So I think uh, unless there's anything else you want to talk about with the background and overview, want to jump into the featured stock? Yeah. I mean, let me just talk about the, the markets real quick, right? So sure. today was obviously a pretty ugly day. Last week was a pretty ugly week. My portfolio has probably pulled back. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've added cash to it, but 25%, maybe 20, 25% in the last week, um, which is painful. But, you know, I have to admit a lot of those stocks got ahead of themselves. You know, when I was buying Mohawk at 12 and it rallied up into the forties, um, you know, it was probably due to take a breather, you know, when I mean, I've been buying Celsius since last summer when it was in the teens and then it rallied up into the seventies, you know, Derm Tech went from 40 to 85 in a month and uh, Upstart went from 40 to 105 in about a month and a half. So, you know, if you're going to invest in these high growth companies, you have to, you know, pick your style. Either you try to get in early and then get out early, or at least, you know, when, when maybe when the, the, the stock is topping out and then hope for a pullback. But of course, you don't always get one. So then you have to time the top right and time the bottom right. And a lot of people are not good at doing both. Um, so my strategy is just a little bit different now. I mean, I am... Uh, letting my winners run. So if I buy stock at 40 and it runs to 80, I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to trim it. And then as that stock runs out of steam and it pulls back, you know, to the 60s or 50s, you know, that's when I can add to that position because normally these are stocks that I'm going to be holding for the next three, four or five years. So to me, it's kind of, if I really believe a stock can 5X or 10X over the next five years, it's just pointless to try to keep timing the ins and the outs and just racking up the tax bill for myself. I'd rather just be patient and let them pull back and then, you know, add to them over time since I do have some cash flow coming in where I can do that. So when I talk on Twitter about, you know, dollar cost averaging, that's what I mean. You know, just whether you have 5,000 coming in every month or 10,000 or 20,000, you know, allocate that capital, um, you know, across your positions on a weekly or monthly basis so that you're not trying to time the tops and the bottoms. Yeah, perfect. Good advice. Perfect. Thank you, Jonah. Okay. So Derm Tech. Um, so I did this write up on my Substack newsletter, I think back in late January. Um, I don't remember exactly how I found this company. So if anyone, <laughs> whoever, whoever is responsible for putting Derm Tech on my radar, um, I owe you a steak dinner, broccoli dinner, whatever, whatever floats your boat, but you let me know and, and I'll take you out to a nice fancy dinner and I'll wine and dine you because this is uh, this is my largest position in my personal account and it's a larger position in my social capital fund. Um, it's not the largest position in the social capital fund only because I, you know, I've only been investing money there for three days and, you know, this stock has already had a nice run over the last month. So I'm not going to try to chase it and build a full position right now, especially since the company is reporting earnings tomorrow. And then I'll be interviewing the CEO, uh, John Doback next Tuesday. So that should be a, a great interview. And the company actually jumped at the opportunity to do the interview. So I'm hoping that that is a good sign that they're going to report some good earnings. But, you know, even if it's not a, you know, like blowout earnings report, you know, we have to, I mean, I'll talk about what the company does in a second, but, you know, just keep in mind, I mean, this company, uh, you know, we're all coming out of a pandemic. You know, there was a lot of, you know, dermatologist offices that were closed down during the pandemic, you know, during the, you know, at least part of Q4. So even if volume numbers come in a little bit light, not that I expect them to, but if they do, you know, keep that in mind. A lot of these companies, you know, you should ignore 2020 to a certain extent and focus more on 2021 and 2022, because that's what's going to move these stock prices. But so Derm Tech, let me talk about the company for a second. Um, based in California, what they created was a genomics based smart patch. Some call it a sticker. Um, I prefer smart patch. So dermatologists, you know, when they look at your mole or what people call it, what, you know, the technical term is a uh, pigmented lesion, but a mole, you know, if the mole on your skin looks suspicious, the old way of doing this, the archaic way of doing it, is to get out the magnifying glass, you know, look at it under the magnifying glass. If they see, if they see something suspicious, you know, they'll order a biopsy. Uh, so then you go to the lab and they, you know, they, they, they cut it out with a scalpel and send it off and, you know, to be analyzed. And then a week later you get a report, for, you know, or the dermatologist office calls you and tells you, you know, if there's something good or bad with that mole, you know, what, what Dermtech is doing is taking it to the 
you know, the RNA level, the, this is what makes it the genomic smart patch. So instead of actually, you know, what, what they say, we use, you know, stickers instead of scalpels. So the dermatologist pulls out the Dermtech patch, which has uh, five stickers in it. And they put those stickers over your moles and then they circle the mole. And then they send that patch back. They, they put the patch back in the pouch and they send those five patches back to the lab in California to be analyzed. And, and then three days later, the dermatologist will get a report from Dermtech with the results of that patch. So it is, it's faster, it's, it, it's a little bit more expensive, but um, we're talking, you know, there's, there's no pain, it's totally non-invasive, and there's a 99% accuracy with these patches. So, you know, right now the patches are for melanoma, which is one form of skin cancer, it's the most deadly form. There's two other main forms of skin cancer. Dermtech is currently developing patches for those as well. Uh, and then they're also developing patches for other types of skin diseases. Um, and then they're also coming out with a, uh, a kit called Luminate, which would be more of a DTC product where you would order the, the, the kit from Dermtech directly. They would most likely ship it to your house, although perhaps dermatologists you know, end up in the middle of that too. But this, uh, this kit would enable you to, I'm assuming, I, I don't know all the details yet, but I'm assuming it's some sort of a genomic smart patch as well. And then you would get a report and, you know, on some scale, I don't know if it's one to 10 or one to a hundred, they haven't really released that information yet, but it would tell you how much UV damage has been done to your skin. And then they would give you steps on how to, you know, repair your skin. And this is where they're working with companies like Johnson & Johnson, L'Oreal, you know, the big skincare cosmetics companies. I'm assuming it's some sort of a, a partnership. I don't know if, if Dermtech would be, you know, if they're actually developing, you know, skincare products with those companies, or if it would be more of like a, like a lead gen service where, you know, you come to the Dermtech website, you know, to get your report and they say, yep, on a scale of one to 10, you know, the damage to your skin is a 27, you know, for people that have a 27, we would, you know, recommend that you use this product like that, that I don't know yet. I'm just kind of guessing here, but it, it might be something like that where they would make money off of, you know, the, the, the kit, but also the, you know, either selling products or generating leads for some of these, these other skincare companies. So, you know, Dermtech's doing, I mean, they're going to be doing a lot in the area of non-invasive, you know, skincare detect, you know, early detection or treatment, repair, all of that. So just a very, very cool company. I mean, every year there's over 4 million biopsies done in the US. So that's probably the kind of the, the starting TAM for this company. But when you start to add in all these other products, the TAM obviously gets much, much bigger than that. Uh, right now, Dermtech's about a $1.6 billion company. I think they still have around 100 or $150 million in cash from a stock offering they did in January. So you shouldn't, you probably won't see any more stock offerings at least this year, maybe ever. Um, the company, I mean, they obviously haven't reported 2020 numbers yet. We'll get those tomorrow. Uh, my guess is they're only gonna be five, six, seven million for last year, which is obviously pretty small. But this year, I think, I, I at least hope we get guidance somewhere between 16 and 18 million. Maybe, maybe they end up doing over 20 million, especially if Luminate becomes part of that. Um, and then going forward, you know, I mean, I've put together some rough numbers. So uh, when I got into Dermtech back in January, I, I said that there is, I mean, this is an easy five bagger over the next five years, probably a 10 bagger, maybe even a 20 bagger. If you look at exact sciences and what their charts look like over the last five years, that was a 20 bagger. So I'm kind of using the exact sciences, you know, traje trajectory as, um, you know, where what I think Dermtech could do because they are similar companies in, in you know, the kind of the cancer detection space. Um, so, oh, oh yeah, I'm pulling up my revenues. So give me two seconds. Um, so I, I, I mean, I do put together revenue projections for all of my top holdings. You know, when you go to a website like Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg or Ticker, you know, any of the other sources that we use, you know, typically you're going to see maybe the next 12 months, maybe the next two years in some cases. Um, but that data is obviously only as good as the analysts that are submitting their, their estimates. 
But, you know, I, I sometimes have to go out three, four, five years if I'm trying to figure out whether a company can really 5X, 10, 10X, 20X. And based on my numbers, right, these are just my numbers. So I have 2020, 2020 revenues at 6 million, uh, 2021 at, well, actually, give me two seconds. I was to make sure I had the numbers right. Yeah, uh, so 20, I don't know, I, la I labeled the columns wrong. Um, so 2020, 6 million, 2021, I have 21 million. It's obviously pretty aggressive. 2022, 70 million. 2023, about 200 million. 2024, um, 500 million. And then 2025, would be 1 billion. So that's where I think the company can get to 1 billion in annual revenues by 2025. Um, I'd have to double check the numbers, but I, I think the CAGR was somewhere around like 187% revenue growth if they went from 6 million to a billion in five years. Um, but I think it's absolutely possible just given the size of the market and some of the products that are already in development. Um, you know, going through trials right now, plus Luminate, which uh, could be launching any day now. They've already put up the website for Luminate and you can already sign up and get on the waiting list for the kits. So um, I, I don't know yet if Luminate revenues are gonna, you know, come in this year, um, but we'll, we'll find out soon enough. But if, if, if DermTech can get to a billion dollars in revenue by 2025, I mean, you could easily, you know, and then just based on what the, you know, the growth rates are going into that year, and gross margins, which right now are pretty low, but those will obviously expand quickly. I mean, you could easily put a 2025 multiple, uh, you know, price to sales multiple on that billion dollars of revenue and get to a 20, $25 billion revenue uh, value, 20 to $25 billion valuation by 2025. So that's kind of, you know, what I'm thinking in terms of DermTech and why it's still my biggest position and why I didn't trim any shares at 84 a couple of weeks ago and why I'm buying shares this week in the 60s, you know, both my personal account and the uh, social capital fund. Great. So, so let me ask you, you brought up exact sciences and, and that's what sparked uh, my interest in DermTech uh, a couple months ago. Um, I was around when exact sciences was down at the low before it had its 20 bagger run. I, I was in the stock and and I missed it though. I got shaken out, right? So I'm like, I don't want to miss it the second time. So <laughs> the, qu the question is, uh, to what extent is their business, uh, their business model, the total adjustable market and also margins similar or different to exact sciences? So I've never done a deep dive on exact sciences. I really don't know that company as well. I've never okay. owned the stock at all. Um, I just know a lot of people in the genomic space. Um, they try to compare DermTech and exact sciences. I believe Exact Sciences is do, doing colon, colon cancer, yep. you know, detection. Um, I'm, I'm more or less just talking about, you know, the last five years of revenue growth, you know, compounded annual revenue growth for Exact Sciences um, is in that like 180 to 190, you know, percent per year. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you look at the chart of exact sciences, and it was a 20 bagger over the last five years, that's, that's kind of where I draw the comparison and say, if DermTech can mm -hmm. replicate exact sciences growth over the last five years, then you should see a stock chart that looks similar to what exact sciences did. So if we're looking at 1 billion by 2025, does that match up with the total addressable market, you think, compared to colon cancer and skin cancer? I, I, I haven't looked it up myself. Uh, I probably should have, but do, do you know off the top of your head, colon cancer versus skin I, cancer? I don't know the size of the colon cancer market, no. Okay. Um, I mean, the skin cancer market, I mean, it's still, it's it's kind of crazy, but I mean, the fact that no one else really did this before DermTech did it, I mean, this is kind of a, a wide open market where, you know, it, just like Transmedics is creating these OCS units to compete with the ice cooler, right, which is the old way of transporting organs, you know, DermTech is creating these patches to compete with the old way of doing it, which is, you know, cutting out your mole with a scalpel. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, they're really kind of creating this new category for themselves. So I, I don't really know if anyone knows the true TAM of, of what this market might look like, other than, you know, if you say there's 4 million biopsies every year, and you multiply that by, um, 
$760, which is the current cost of a, you know, the Derm Tech patch set, you know, that's 3 billion, that's 3 billion in revenue right there. Um, now, it, oh. obviously, will every biopsy, you know, like be preempted by the Derm Tech patch? No, probably not. But, you know, I would think that Derm Tech would be able to capture a, a portion of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you wonder how much bigger does the TAM grow? You know, will dermatologists knowing that there's a non-invasive way to detect skin cancer, will they be more quick, like more quick to pull the trigger on the germ tech patch rather than the scalpel, you know, so that does that increase the size of the TAM by two or three X where, you know, the doctor is like, well, it might be suspicious, but I really don't want to pull the scalpel out unless I really think so. But, oh, wait, now I have this non-invasive patch where we don't have to pull out the scalpel, you know, in three days, in three days, we'll find out if there's actually something suspicious. I can see dermatologists moving in that direction a lot quicker. So that's where I think, you know, you look at the 4 million biopsies and I think that might be a middle, a little misleading on what the TAM could actually be. Uh, I'm getting some private messages, some collaborative research in real time coming in right now. We got uh, from a couple of members here, uh, skin cancer is the number one cancer in the US. One in five Americans will develop skin cancer by the age of 70. We got someone else here telling us this year an estimated 147,950 adults in the United States will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer. About 5.4 million basal and squamous cell skin cancers are diagnosed each year in the United States. So basically, the point I'm hearing, if these uh, people are correct, sorry, I can't see your names for some okay, reason. I mean, skin, skin, is, can, is skin cancer skin is cancer, the biggest, right? Right. Skin cancer is massive. Well, that's, I mean, if you, yeah. that's massive. If you, oh, it's mass. oh, absolutely. It's definitely the biggest. I, yeah. I just, I didn't know the exact yeah. numbers. I mean, and then, so recently the stock started moving higher. You know, this is going back two weeks. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Texas came out and said that they are going to cover the cost of the patch for their 6 million members. And, you know, if, if anyone doesn't know, Blue Cross Blue Shield is, they call themselves a federation of, I think it's 32 different organizations, mostly grouped in states. Um, and each of those states has their own member base. Texas is obviously one of the biggest at 6 million, but that's only one. And I would, I would expect the other Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations to come out pretty soon in support of DermTech and their patch, knowing that it's a lot cheaper you know, the quicker you detect skin cancer, the earlier that you can find it and remove it or treat it, it's a lot cheaper for the insurance companies than dealing with it, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later after it's become advanced. So, you know, these insurance companies are not stupid. I mean, they don't, you know, they care about the bottom line and they would rather pay, pay 760 now to detect it early than, you know, a hundred times that in a few years. A thousand yeah, times that. I am very glad you brought up the insurance companies because uh, that brings up why I got shaken out of exact sciences. In fact, you know, maybe I'll, I'll share my uh, chart right here to show you what happened. Um, so this is exact sciences. I, I was in this uh, stock after the product was approved and on the market. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was Ooh, in it. Uh, that's, a, that's a hell of a drawdown. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, welcome. Uh, Rob was late. Rob's my partner over Rob Market Story Trading. Um, Hi, Jenna. So yeah, I was in here about 25 bucks and then this thing dropped. It had to do with insurance coverage. Uh, I think they were having trouble getting Medicaid coverage or some, some expectation that wasn't met in terms of, I think it was Medicaid coverage and I sold it and I never looked back. And so the whole story of why this stock had the movements down and then up has all to do with insurance coverage. Right. So yeah. I, I've seen you know, some catalysts there with Thermtech about that insurance coverage, with you, which you just brought up, which makes me very optimistic for the future share price appreciation for Thermtech. And now Thermtech, I think it was a $10 stock back in December when the NCCN, so that's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, came out with, you know, their stamp of approval, you know, and basically saying that, you know, Thermtech should be part of the standard of care, um, you know, for dermatologists. And that's when the stock rallied from, you know, the teens up into the twenties. And then someone put it on my radar and, you know, I spent a couple of weeks digging into it. And then I wrote about it, I think when it was in the mid to high thirties 
Um, and, you know, it felt like I was kind of chasing the stock. You know, it, it does suck to buy a company, you know, after it's up 200% in a couple months, you feel like you're chasing it and you're setting yourself up to get burned. But, you know, after digging into this company and it was still just about a billion dollar market cap at the time, looking at the exact sciences chart, you know, I was just, I was kind of drooling over this company because it felt like there was a still plenty of upside to go. So, you know, it's, it's great that it's rally, you know, it's great that it rallied up into the eighties, you know, my year to date returns were looking pretty good with Derm tech at 84 and upstart at one Oh five. And, you know, they've pulled back pretty, you know, pretty harshly, but um, I, I think that's where people need to just get a little bit of dose of reality and realize that these stocks got a little overextended they pull back, you know, some of them are probably sitting on their, on their support, you know, some moving averages. Um, and I think, you know, Derm Tech reports next week, uh, in a couple of weeks, we get uh, Celsius and Mohawk and Upstart and Porch.com. So if anyone's taken a beating on these stocks, um, you know, we might get bailed out with some earnings pretty soon, hopefully. Praying, and, praying. Uh, here's an intriguing chart. This is a market cap chart of Exact sciences to Durham Tech. That, that that tells that tells you that tells you why I'm I'm bullish like you. I mean, if you if you look at it, so exact sciences, um, let me just look at the last five years of revenues. So, 2016 exact sciences did there it is about 99 million in revenue. In 2017, they did 266. In 2018, they did 454. In 2019, they did 876. In 2020, they did 1.5 billion. Let me see. I can actually go back a little bit farther. I got um, a line chart of that up on the screen. So in 2014, you. they did 2 million. So they went from 2 million to 40 to 100 to 266 to 454 to 876 to 1.5 billion. Yep. So you know, so over, so from 2014 until today or until 2000, oh wait, let me shrink this. Um, so from 2014 till through 2020, Exact Sciences has a 206% annualized growth rate. That's insane. But, but honestly, like, I think Derm Tech is the kind of company that could do that as well you know, and go from what was 6 million last year to a billion in 2025. And if they do, I would expect this, you know, the Derm Tech chart to look just like this exact sciences chart or, or close to it. So. Yeah, there you go. And, you know, and that's why we were talking earlier, right before the presentation started, you and I, Jonah, about, you know, when you have these market drawdowns, a lot of times I know almost a certainty. I, I'm not saying Dermatech's one of them. It's sitting on 20 D DMA support and there's a catalyst tomorrow, but there's a lot of stocks where you can see that almost for sure this thing's going down another 15, 20%, but I don't even try to trade it because I'm afraid I'm going to miss getting back in. That's happened to me in the past. So if I'm looking two, three, four, five years out, why bother? Just hold through the volatility. I mean, last, you know, last year was a weird year for me because all of my income disappeared because my company got shut down. So I was in a very, very low tax bracket. I didn't have to worry about short-term cap, be more active in my portfolio. I was trimming stocks or even selling stocks when they got overextended, hoping they would pull back to some support level so I could add them back in. You know, this year, things are different. My income is back. My income is up. And I'm just, I'm investing in a different type of stock. And when these small caps start to move higher, like, they can rip your face off, you know, as we saw the last few weeks, especially with some, you know, big catalysts like insurance and FDA approvals and, and things of that sort, or, you know, when the big funds get involved. I mean, you know, the, uh, a, a few weeks ago, uh, Transmedics was up 15 or 20% in a day. And it was the day before I released my write-up and people thought that it was me kind of letting my buddies get in. It had nothing to do with that. I mean, the SEC filings, show that BlackRock and Fidelity were building positions in Transmedics that, you know, on, on that day or the, the Friday before. So, you know, once these, I mean, for me, the goal is to try to get in before those big funds start taking positions. Cause once they do like they're buying, I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of shares at a time or over a, you know, a, a week or two week period. So you, you got to get in early and you got to be patient, have to be patient with these small cap stocks the drawdowns are a little bit rougher, but the upsides are bigger. 
Perfect. Sounds good. Uh, Rob, did he have any questions for Jonah about Dermatech before we move forward? Move on. I actually have an embarrassing story about it. Two people approached me when Dermatech was at 10. And I'm a <laughs> yeah. biomedical engineer, so I dug into the product. And I liked the product, but I didn't see high profitability at the time. And then the next time I looked at it, it was like 40 or $50. <laughs> and I ended up buying like $60 later on with like a 10% physician. And I, I usually don't do that. I'm like, I missed this one. It's over. But I bought it 600% higher. Oh, uh, so <laughs> Derm Tech right now is sitting exactly on its 20 day EMA. Yeah. So but, with earning with earnings tomorrow, I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, so what I'm paying attention to on earnings is Q4 volume processing. You know, how many how many patches did they process in Q4? And then annualizing that for 2021 and comparing that to the guidance, because I'm curious to see, you know, because that'll kind of tell us whether or not some of that Q4 demand was just, you know, like pent up demand coming through or if, if it's really an acceleration in the business. So. Oh, that's a 50. Yeah. All so right. This, I mean, it's kind of sitting right on that support level. I mean, you get some you know, decent earnings tomorrow, some strong guidance, nice remarks from the company, you know, maybe a couple other insurance carriers come out in the next couple of weeks. I mean, this, this stock could be back in the eighties pretty quickly. Sounds good. Jonah, did he uh, want to talk about any other stocks? Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I just want to, sorry, I just want to add from the product side. Uh, I want to add to your research of, uh, people using a lot more patches. That's one of the things I was thinking about and I totally agree with what you said. I believe since it's a lot like going under the scalpel is tough right. and a lot harder for patients and doctors. I think a lot more people are gonna be using more patches with this product and with the 99% accuracy, it's both like a great simplification for ease of use and increase in accuracy at the same time. And that's why it's becoming like the new standard of care for this uh, type of skin cancer. Right, and, and don't, don't overlook that, wait until a patient, you know, gets a, you know, gets the scalpel and the results come back negative. And then that patient, you know, has a, a scar or whatnot, and then finds out that the patch was available, but the dermatolo dermatologist went with the scalpel instead. And then that patient sues the dermatologist, you know, I mean, Definitely. people love to sue each other. And there's a, uh, you know, there's a lawyer out there waiting to take any suit in the world, regardless of how frivolous it might be. But in this case, I mean, that's, that's a legitimate concern for dermatologists is, you know, isn't it, isn't it a better idea to do the patch first and scalpel second, than go with scalpel first. So um, well, I, that's, I that, that could also push it too. What's that? I wasn't thinking that, but that could also push it. Oh, yeah. Oh, no doubt. And then honestly, I mean, if the dermatologists don't want to get on board with this and they want to just stick with the scalpel, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if Derm Tech said, okay, fine, we'll just do, you know, DTC with this. Now, I don't know how that complicates things with insurance, but, you know, that's always possible. I mean, I, it, there's, there's videos out there where you can see a dermatologist using these patches. I mean, there's nothing to it. You basically clean the skin with an alcohol swab, you put the patch on the mole, you rub it around for five seconds, you take out a black, a black magic marker, you circle the mole, you put the patch back in the pouch and you send it off. Like, that's it. I mean, anyone with half a brain could do that in their living room without the, the help of a dermatologist. So um, I, I think the dermatologists have to get on board with this. Otherwise, they just get left out. Yep. Um, other stocks, I mean, I think everyone knows the stocks that I love. I mean, my top holdings are, you know, in order, uh, Dermtech, Transmedics, Mohawk, Celsius, and Upstart. So my two biggest ads in the last two days were Celsius and Upstart. Uh, Celsius has earnings coming out in the next couple of weeks. Same with Upstart. Um, I, I don't see any way that Celsius doesn't crush the earnings expectations. The only way they don't beat it, in my opinion, is that they literally can't keep up with demand. I mean, I, I probably get 10 messages a day from people that go into their local retail store and the Red Bull shelf is full, the Monster shelf is full, the Celsius shelf is empty. 
Like they cannot keep up with demand. So I don't know if it's just manufacturing can't keep up or distributors can't keep up, but uh, it's pretty clear from everyone that I talk to. Now, granted, I think everyone on FinTwit owns the stock. So they're probably a little bit more apt to drink the, the Celsius over the Monster or the Red Bull. But I don't really know anybody that has you know, tried Celsius and not liked it or liked it less than Monster, Red Bull or Bang, which literally just tastes like you know, chemicals in your mouth. So, you know, Celsius is like a, it's a lighter, more refreshing energy drink, fruity flavors, but not overly sweet. Uh, in many cases, it, it, you know, it's like a slightly fruitier seltzer, seltzer water, um, you know, with caffeine, but not so much caffeine that you're going to get like dizzy or stomach aches or feel nauseous. So I drink two or three a day. I love them. And I just think this company is, is the next monster. And for anyone not familiar, monster was, I think Monster is the, one of the top five or six best performing stocks over the last 20 years. I mean, the stocks literally went from like seven cents to $70 over the last 20 years. It's just insane. Um, it's like, it's literally up there with like uh, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, and Tractor Supply. Those are like the best performing stocks over the last 20 years. So, uh, and I mean, it, the energy market is obviously enormous. It's getting bigger. Monsters, I think a $45 or billion dollar company. Uh, it's right now, it's all about shelf space and distribution. And Celsius is uh, lining up a lot of retail partners, Target, Walmart, they're the number one energy drink on, on Amazon now, which is obviously no small feat. So I, you know, Celsius is pulled back. The multiples, obviously, you know, it's not a cheap stock for good reason because they're growing at 80%. I wouldn't be surprised if the stock grows at hundred percent this year, to be honest, um, you know, because they've, they've really done a great job on e-commerce. They brought on huge retail partners. And now that the gyms are opening back up, and they're a big, you know, they're, they're a big seller in the gyms and fitness centers. You know, right now they kind of have three different channels, you know, all going at the same time, which they've never had before. So I'm a big fan of Celsius. I, I'm adding on any pullbacks pretty aggressively. Um, Upstart, you know, that's another stock I've been loading up on the last couple of days in my personal account and the fund, the social capital fund. Um, what Upstart does is basically they're an, an, an AI powered underwriting model. So they enable banks, you know, traditional banks, as well as these digital first banks, which really haven't come on board yet, but I think that's going to change pretty soon. It allows these companies to have a, a faster, cheaper, more efficient kind of underwriting process where, you know, you don't need a bunch of people sitting in the basement around a table reviewing applications. Everything's done with this AI model that has 15 or 1600 data points versus the traditional underwriting models, which just use FICO scores, which is like 20 data points. Um, so Upstart's way more accurate in terms of uh, evaluating credit worthiness. They have, uh, I mean, like, ten, I think it's tens of billions of data points that they have gathered over the last seven or eight years that, th that enables them to make this, you know, so that this model is truly getting smarter and smarter over time, which gives them a significant competitive advantage over any potential competitors that try to come into the space. You know, no one has eight years of data like Upstart has. And, you know, I think as they bring on more of these traditional brick and mortar bank partners, and then they expand to the digital first banking companies, I would love them to see a do, do a deal with like Square, SoFi, Money Lion, like that would be enormous. Um, right now, they're just doing consumer loans, so kind of you know personal loans up to fifty thousand. But they've already announced that they're getting into auto loans. And Dan Loeb, who's a big, um, he was an early investor and a current shareholder, uh, the big hedge fund guy. Uh, he's already he's already on the record saying that the company is going to get into mortgages, credit cards, student loans. So. You know, the, the credit markets are just, I mean, literally endless in terms of TAM. And I think Upstart's going to be a huge winner over the next five, 10 years. So, I mean, the stock got ahead of itself at 105. It's pulled back into the 60s. It dipped below, actually dipped below 60 today and even closed today at, at 57.50, which is a joke. Uh, I mean, this company is growing at 60% a year. I wouldn't be surprised if they do 70 or 80% this year or next year with 84% gross margins, and they're already EBITDA and net income uh, positive. So a lot a lot to like with Upstart. Awesome. Sounds good. Can, can I ask you about Porch real quick? 
Um, yep, I, I've heard, all I know about it is I've heard it characterized as the Amazon of the real estate industry. And yeah, to me, I mean, those are two big things to say, <laughs> right? With a very small market cap. So is there anything there? I know. I mean, that's I. That's probably a stretch. Amazon. Yeah, I don't know if I, I couldn't endorse that. <laughs> right. um, it, it's an interesting company. You know, they, they came public via SPAC recently. Um, I found the stock when it was around 15. It pulled, you know, and then I did my write up when it was around 15 or 16. It pulled back to, I think, 14. And then it rallied up into the mid 20s pull back below 20. So I've, I've been adding the last couple of days on porch. It's now sitting right around 18. So, you know, I was obviously real estate's on fire. You know, a lot of people are moving out of the city, moving into the suburbs, uh, buying second homes because obviously mortgage, mortgage rates are pretty cheap. So I was looking for a small cap way to kind of play this, you know, this real estate boom. Um, you know, Open Door is too big, Zillow's too big, Redfin had such a massive run last year, and Redfin's obviously competing with Zillow and, and Open Door and some others. And I just thought Porch had an interesting business model. Um, so what they're trying to do is, I mean, they're they're trying to be the God, I'm trying to think like what I'm trying to think what what is a good comparison. Um, yeah, Amazon's not Amazon's a tough one. So what they do is, so they, they created ERP and CRM software for inspecting inspection companies and moving companies. And they allow those companies to use their ERP and, and CRM software for free, as long as they're providing customer data to Porch. So if you have, you know, so say you're an inspection company and you're doing, you know, out of Boston and you're doing 250 inspections uh, a week, um, obviously means someone is buying or selling a house and moving somewhere else, then Porch is getting that data and they can contact that buyer or seller, get in with them early, start to build the relationship and then upsell them all these other services. Um, you know, right. the, the cable, the internet, the security, the landscaping, you know, connect them with local contractors for painting, remodeling, you know, putting up a fence, like everything that homeowner needs. So, when I did my write-up, I kind of called Porch the, the vertically integrated operating system for a homeowner, where like the idea is that you're moving, to, you know, you're buying a house in a new area, you don't know any service providers, and Porch is there to basically connect you with everything that you need to, you know, to get your house set up the way that you want it. And it's just, it just, it's a very interesting customer flywheel where they, you know, yeah. created software, give it away for free in order to get customer data and get in with those homeowners six months, six weeks before they actually move into their house. So I just thought it was a very unique company. Um, they've done a couple, they've done actually four or five acquisitions, you know, very accretive acquisitions over the last couple of months. Um, so the company's, I mean, uh, you add that revenue on and the company's growing at like 134, like 134%, I think, although that's not all organic. Some of that came from acquisition, but even if you back out the acquisition revenue growth, the company's still growing at, I think it was like 60 or 70% um, at a very reasonable valuation. It was under 2 billion when I wrote about it. So. Great. Thank you. Well, I think we're coming up on an hour. So uh, a few housekeeping notes here, uh, Jonah. First, I want to let people know who are part of the story trading VIP community, we are going to be opening a Dermatech research group. So look out for that. If you're in the VIP chat, we'll open that up tonight to collaborate further on Dermatech. Um, as far as uh, Jonah goes, you can go to his website, jonahlupton.com. I'm actually a subscriber to Substack, so I definitely recommend that. Um, just click on that throw in your email <laughs> and it's just a 10, $10 a month over there. Very. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's Jonah Lupton dot substack dot com backslash subscribe. So, Perfect. and you can do, so you can be a free subscriber if you want, you know, you don't, obviously you don't pay anything. You still get the write-ups, but you get the write-ups uh, three or four days after the paid subscribers. And then also the interviews, you still get the interviews, but you get them three or four days later. So. Uh, perfect. And I want to let you know about story trading. If you want to know of our future upcoming events, you just go to the website, click events. Um, I'm going to show you a couple events coming up right now. Uh, that's the wrong, wrong link. There we go. So you click on events. We have, uh, you know, Richard Chu. Richard Chu is coming this Sunday night to talk about his digital health picks. Again, another connection I created because of Dario. 
Uh, then we got Mark Combs, Mark Gomes next Wednesday, pr uh, presenting on asset allocation, portfolio management strategies. And then we have an, a new VIP pick from a member of our community. Ashley Day is a frequent contributor and has got an exciting pick come in on March 14th. Um, let's see what else to review. Uh, if you don't know story trading, go ahead, please follow us on YouTube um, and Twitter, twitter.com slash story trading, YouTube, just Go to YouTube and search for story trading. You can find us there. And what else we got? If you want to become a VIP member, you can go to website, click on VIP. It's going to be a little bit limited. We can uh, uh, collaborate through WhatsApp right now, which is limited to about 250 people. We got 140 subscribers. So, you know, if you're interested in collaborating, what we do is all about crowdsource collaboration. So, uh, get in there, find nuggets of information. We help people, you know, get the research and, and make good decisions. Um, so if you want to be part of that process and maybe present some stocks to the community, then I recommend you join us. But again, we're going to be limited, uh, about 140 people and we're going to be maxed out at 250. So you can take a look at that. Uh, any other last words, Jonah, before we say goodbye to everyone? No, I mean, just, uh, emphasize to people, you know, this market's been a little crazy bipolar the last week, you know, be patient. If you, if you understand your companies and you've done the due diligence and you have conviction, then the only thing you should be doing is, is being patient. Um, don't panic sell. Now, I mean, if you want to, you know, say you have 30 positions and, you know, you get a drawdown in your entire portfolio, um, you know, that's typically where I would sell my, you know, let's say my five least favorite positions or the stocks that I think maybe have the most downside or the least amount of upside, you know, least conviction, whatever you want to call it. And then I would use that cash and add it to my other, you know, top 10, 15 holdings. So that's typically what I do when the volatility, you know, starts to spike or the, you know, the, the, the pullback gets a little bit more vicious. Um, you know, I'll, I'll consolidate into my highest conviction stock. So that's why, you know, last week I did trim off four or five positions and, added to my favorites, you know, Durham Tech, Transmedics, Upstart, because those are also the companies that I think have the, the most powerful upcoming catalysts. So, you know, that's, that's really how I invest, you know, find these high growth companies at reasonable valuations with powerful catalysts coming up, buy them, add to them, and just be patient. Perfect. Sounds good, Jonah. Just one last thing I wanted to mention, I forgot to mention, at our uh, YouTube, we just released a VIP pick that was presented to our community last Wednesday. Uh, just came out of our uh, seven day embargo period. It's uh, Mace is the ticker symbol. I encourage you to look at this video because this uh, presenter, Greg Fisher, is his first presentation. And he did an awesome job of uh, bringing the four pillars together. We talk about fundamental sentiment, catalysts, and technicals uh, in order to make a good trade. Uh, trade idea. And he did that really, really well. I was very impressed with this presentation. So you can go ahead and look at that presentation uh, this evening. Uh, thank you, Jonah. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Take care. Have a good Bye, night. Bye, guys. Have a good Bye. night. Good night.